Greetings, mortals. My name is Uwatu. I am a watcher. For untold eons, I have observed the trials and tribulations of the planet Earth. I have bore witness to an age unlike any other. I have seen men and women become more than what they are. I have seen an age of heroes, legends, and marvels. I am here to ask the one called Seafarer to chronicle the history of the Marvel Universe by picking a comic from each decade the company has been in existence. He is to start at the beginning and arrive at the present day. I have picked him to examine the history of the Marvel Universe based on his qualifications. Hang on. You're reviewing a DC comic? Mr. Marvel Universe? The guy who knows everything about the Marvel Universe? In Marvel Comics number one, the first Marvels appeared in your calendar year of 1939. It launched an age unlike any other. Hey, I think they get it already. I was planning to review this comic anyway. Let's get a move on. Sorry. Well, I guess I have to look the part, even though I look like my grandfather. Marvel Comics number one is the comic that started it all. This was the first comic Marvel put out when it was called Timely Comics in the 1930s, and today is worth over $200,000. The comic itself was noted for having the first appearances of several characters that would become important in the Marvel Universe in the modern era. These characters include the original Android Human Torch and Namor the Submariner, who made a second appearance in this book after he showed up in a book called Motion Picture Bunnies Weekly. In retrospect, putting a character as moody as Namor in a comic that has bunnies in the title may not have been the best call. The book itself was an anthology with several people working on it. It was the sort of thing in the 30s where several writers and artists would work on one book. In this comic case, we had Carl Burgos penning the origin of the Android Human Torch, and Bill Everett writing Namor's adventure. Other characters appeared in the book, but I won't be covering them. These included the Angel, Kazar, and the Mask Raider. Phew! I almost said Mask Raider. That would have pissed some people off. Right off the bat, you'll notice that some of these names sound familiar. That's because when Stanley and others were forming the contemporary Marvel Universe in the 1960s, they used some Golden Age character names to create all new characters that had no relation to their older counterparts. These characters included Human Torch, Kazar, Angel, and an alien known as the Vision. Honestly, aside from the Torch and Namor, the others weren't as renowned or successful. Namor and the Human Torch, in my opinion, were the biggest stars to come out of this very old anthology. Both characters proved to be larger than life and had a legacy that continues to this day. They were the first to Marvel's heroes, and when you consider that one is an android and the other is an Atlantean prince, you begin to understand just why Marvel's heroes would later fit the mold of being the people you'd least expect to be heroes. This cover is gorgeous and a classic. The Human Torch melting through a wall predates the Kool-Aid Man doing the same thing, and to be honest, I'd be more scared of a flaming man coming through a wall than some corporate mascot. Painter Alex Ross redid the cover for his series Marvels, and the guy did a fantastic job enhancing what is already a good cover that does its job of drawing the people in. The style is very eye-catching, the characters are dynamic, you'd want to buy this comic now if you had billions of cash burning a hole in your pocket. I think I can get out of this cover long enough, it's time to move on, even if it is really great. Our story begins with an inventor named Phineas Horton talking to the press about the android he invented, who was also encased in an airtight tube. He explains that there was a flaw in the design of the android, as when he's exposed to oxygen, he spontaneously combusts. Naturally, the people are freaked out about this. I think this is what people really meant. Witchcraft! Hey, wait, Bob, did you see that new Wizard of Oz movie? I hear it's in color. Mm, I don't think it'll catch on. 
News spread about the amazing Human Torch, and other men arrived to take a closer look at Horton's creation. They asked if there was any way for him to control the fire. Sadly, there isn't a way, and in the end, they all decide that the best way to deal with the potential weapon of mass destruction is to bury it where no one would ever find it. Horton, of course, declares that he will one day figure out how to stabilize the fire. Much like other plans to bury stuff, it doesn't work as there's an explosion which wakes up Horton. He realizes that the blast came from Torch's tomb. As Torch makes his way to the town, burning everything in his path, he wonders why he's on fire and why everything turns to flame. Uh, maybe because you keep touching it? This is hilarious. The local fire department tries to put out the fire and all they get is steam. The Torch seems to be having a good time seeing all the things on fire and laughing about it. Don't worry, he becomes a very important superhero later, I think. I hope. In an attempt to douse out the fire after figuring out how dangerous he is, he dies into a pool, which promptly evaporates by the time the homeowners go to see what happens. It turns out the home is owned by con men named Sardo and Red, and they mean to do some 1930s-style gangster violence. One of the thugs gets the bright idea to use them since the torch is worth a lot of money. They go to a company to sell insurance, and when things don't go their way, they take the trapped torch to the warehouse and crack the glass, hoping Torchy will burninate the peasants. Realizing that the men he was hanging out with aren't the nice guys he thought they were, he decides to dole out some android vengeance, and to his surprise, he flies after the men who really thought this plan through, didn't they? You see? This is why you don't trick AIs. They're gonna get you in the end. This is a lesson that will be very valuable to you in the coming decades. Torch arrives and burns down the place in a failed attempt to find Sardo, and after taking care of his men, sirens are heard and Horton arrives on the scene to see what his beloved creation has done, meaning tons of property damage and caught crooks. In the blaze, Horton notices a nitro tank that may explode at any minute. Thinking fast, Torch goes towards the nitro and is promptly put out. Of course, the guy tries to shoot him and the bullet just melts. Dude, the guy saved your life. Show some gratitude, will ya? The Torch eventually finds Sardo and he begs for mercy. The Torch doesn't buy it for a second and the man throws sulfuric acid on a fiery ant. <laughs> wow. Somebody fails chemistry. With the day saved and Sardo dead, Torch uses another vat of nitro to help him control his powers. As he walks around, the cops try to nab him, and after explaining all that happened to him, the droid is sent to live with Horton. The android explains that he can now control his fire, and his creator just sees dollar signs. Some people. Realizing that humans just want to use him, he leaves and later becomes a hero, and not some calculator that can burn stuff. In fact, his last lines to him speak volumes. No, Horton, I'll be free. And no one will ever use me for selfish gain or crime. In other words, bad human. I'm gonna go on my own solo adventures and learn about morality the right way. Now let's talk about Nemo's adventure. Salvage operators work on a ship that sank when they are attacked by Prince Nemo of Atlantis. Jeez. All this because Susan Storm hasn't been born yet. Namor attacks the Imperial Air Breathers and the ship they rode in on before heading home. There he is greeted by the Holy One, who commends him on a job well done. Namor presents the bodies of the men to his mother, Fen. As she approaches, he asks why she hates the surface world so much that she had him kill the invaders to the realm. Not holding anything back, Fen explains that many decades ago, a ship called the Oracle was in the Antarctic Sea conducting experiments. However, these experiments killed a great number of Atlanteans. Ben, the princess, was sent to investigate what happened and fell in love with this lonely sailor named Leonard Mackenzie. Later, she finds out that she is pregnant. How long was he staying with her before he figured out she had gills? You'd think he'd notice something like that. The sailors on board ask her how she is able to survive the cold depths because of how human she looks, even though her skin is a nice shade of blue. Ben ends up sending messages back and forth from the Atlantean city and told the troops underwater that the surface dwellers were too strong for them. 
They do not listen to the princess and proceed to attack anyway. Whew, this isn't gonna end well. Because the humans massacred the troops and invaded their realm, Ben believes that the surface world must be punished for their crimes. Some time later, Namor and his cousin Dorma attack a lighthouse, hoping to destroy some of the ships nearby. They attack some guards, and in order to escape, they commandeer a biplane and fly off into the sea. Ah, hero. Okay, okay. I know what you're thinking. These guys aren't really superheroes. Well, look at it this way. The Human Torch was used and abused by thugs, and even his creator in the end. He caught the bad guy and still laughed when he found out that Horton was being a greedy jerk. Torch had a sense of right and wrong and wasn't going to take being used. In Namor's case, he was out for revenge on the people who hurt his fellow Atlanteans. There's a reason why he's called the Avenging Son, after all. He wants to right what he thinks have been wrongdoings against his people. Does it make right or wrong? That's up for debate. Still, he's got a colorful history of missteps to look forward to. At least he smashed some Nazis along the way. The last story also doubled as Namor's origin story, and we find out why exactly he hates the surface world. But that out of the way, let's examine how both of these stories fit in the grand scheme of things. This comic is good and holds up pretty well against the passage of time. The art's good and the stories had heroes who really weren't your typical heroes, and not anything like the extreme heroes from the 90s. I can easily see this book being retold with very minor tweaks, as there's nothing really offensive here. Unlike, say, Bad Ombre. While I only covered these two characters, the rest of the stories were okay. They weren't as gripping as the others, and as time went on, the characters in them didn't really have much staying power as Torch and Namor. Of course, both heroes eventually found their way to the core Marvel Universe, as it was Namor who returned first in the page of the Fantastic Four number 4. Only to fall in love with Susan Storm Richards. See? That Joe Familiar makes sense now. Namor was an on-again, off-again superhero for years until he joined the Avengers after fellow Golden Age hero Captain America vouched for him. Later, the Android Human Torch would return, and while a fiery young upstart named Johnny took his mantle, he too found a place amongst Earth's mightiest heroes. The Human Torch's story could be seen by some as a story like Frankenstein's monster. However, what set it apart from that tale was how Horton's creation gained self-control. And while his beginnings were brought with danger, the flawed hero he was set the stage for generations of heroes yet to come. In contrast, Namor was the polar opposite of the Torch, a prince from an undersea kingdom who had ties to both worlds. Namor's roots as an anti-hero were here as he was an angry young man who readers could identify with during the depths of the Great Depression. Of course, the ship on his shoulder grew like a fungus as the years went by. With the introduction of Captain America in 1941, Marvel's Golden Age Trinity was complete and was ready to take their place in comic book history. The story, of course, does not end here. Next time we'll be covering heroes that followed in the Golden Age's footsteps to become classics in their own right. It's best to remember the Golden Age that came before us so we can see where we come from and where we are heading. Until next time, I'm Seafarer, and I'll see you in the funny pages.